Here's a short video on parrots, position altered, random repetition of transportation signature. I hope you like it. Let's see. First we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, Avonet privacy. The, the Avonet's basically a, uh, a mobile wireless network that operates in vehicles and so it's called you know Vonnet stands for vehicular ad hoc network and so the space that we're working in in terms of Vonnet privacy is in the region between uh, that that I guess overlaps the concept of privacy the concept of vehicle surveillance and the concept of mobile wireless networks Bas basically we want to be able to preserve our privacy while we're driving our cars uh, even though there's mobile wireless networks equipment on board. I important to note that there's the Vonnet technical standards are still under development although they are starting to solidify. Um, the most recent one was IEEE 1609.2 was released in April of 2013 just a month ago and uh, uh, basically the thing to know about about Vonnet uh, technical standards is there's two um, two tracks so to speak in terms of the uh, uh, the network and transport pr uh, layers <clears throat> and we are going to focus in on the security services for these layers that's really where this work that I'm doing f uh, fits in it covers both IEEE 1609.2 and also SAE J2735 um, we'll, we can discuss that in another video the important point is to know which technical standards it is we're addressing now in 1609.2 the message formats and processing area is where we're focusing. Jared's handling trust, I'm handling privacy. And again, the first non-draft version of uh, 1609.2 just came out. SAE uh, J2735 is the DSRC message set. That's the dedicated short-range communications message set. It's the range uh, of communications that's uh, specially designated for vehicular communications. The three main things that it's uh, supposed to to help us with is uh, safety, uh, traffic conge congestion, and um, uh, other services. Uh, the basic safety message is probably the most studied and most important message of all of the of all the messages in this set. The pro vehicle message is also very important. I'm not sure exactly how the location-based services will handle what which message will be used for that. Uh, maybe there's more than one that could be used but the travel information one might be something that uh, would fall into that category. Um, so not worrying too much about the, the specific message sets. The basic crypto cryptography for um, for Vonets follows this pattern as it does for any other type of uh, 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 you know PKI type model. I made a whole separate video on, of this, so please check YouTube for the other video. It describes the crypto in more detail. Now, as far as privacy is concerned, there's several items of, uh, several properties of privacy that are looked for and discussed in the literature, and there's some techniques and problems associated with these. Number one, unlinkability. Unlinkability means you can't track a person to his real identity. It's unlinkable. The way this is, has been addressed in the literature is to use pseudo-identifiers. Basically, each car will have hundreds of thousands of pseudo-identifiers over its lifetime, each one valid for probably five minutes. And um, so there's just a whole bunch of identifiers. Of course, the problem is key management. How do you load up all those keys into the vehicle and keep track of which ones are which? It's an issue. Also, certificate revocation is an issue. The second major property of Vonnet privacy is untrackability. Uh, people don't want their cars to be trackable or stocked in any way. Um, if somebody, uh, either somebody hacks an, a, a location-based service or just a location-based service uh, user or, or administrator is able to track your car, some people don't want that to happen. There's many reasons why you wouldn't want people to know where your vehicle is. Um, the way that this has been discussed in the literature is to have synchronized pseudo-identifier changes. So in other words, multiple cars will change their pseudo-identifiers at the same time. So when they switch over those five-minute periods, they all, several of them do it at once. This keeps um, 
you know, the, the, what they call K anonymity. If there's K cars in that group that change, then you know there's there's you know you, you lose trackability uh, by by one over you know each car becomes a one over K probability of getting the right car to track. Uh, anyway, that's a detail. We'll do another video on the math of this later. But the problem with uh, this untrackability technique of synchronized pseudo ID change is if the traffic is dense, it works great. But if the traffic is sparse, it does not. If there's only one car changing its ID, you haven't really got any untrackability. So the idea would be somebody could uh, point an antenna at your house and track you as long as you're not within a bunch, the range of a bunch of other cars. Scalability kind of goes along with this. There's no real solution for scalability. It's an open question. Again, sparsity and density are factors. I've come up with a method called flares which deals with scalability but it has other problems and we'll talk about that again in another presentation. Efficiency. Obviously we have to keep the network efficient and we can't over congest the, the wireless uh, uh, you know, wireless communications with unnecessary messages. If we minimize the privacy message requests then we're going to have efficiency. Unfortunately efficiency and effectiveness usually work against each other. Finally, conditionality. Most of the privacy models well, look for, well, most people would say they would want to want conditional privacy. In other words, we want privacy in most circumstances, but if there were an accident or some you know, terrorist situation, you could go back and check and see who was where, when, and relink those identities together. Conditionality and unlinkability tend to work also at odds with each other just as efficiency and scalability work at, at odds. Uh, I think user choice is important but apparently nobody else does so I guess I'll leave that issue to another day. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to talk about defense against collaborative attacks where two types of attackers are collaborating, a local and a global for example. Uh, this Parrots model um, uh, addresses that problem. But it does require different pseudo IDs at different le levels, like for example the BSM would have to have a different pseudo ID from the, um, the, the, the PVM for example for this to work otherwise the antennas could check them out. And we'll talk about it later. Okay. So basically contribution to this paper is if you have a collaborative attack if you have someone who can control the local antennas and also a, lo a location-based service, uh, the Parrots model does defend against that type of an attack. So let's talk about the Parrots model. Again, the threat model is the ability to control two levels of the infrastructure. Now, if you think about, say, Google, Google might have a location-based service and it might not control the antennas that the government owns, but it may have enough money to put up some antennas at key intersections. So it could still have some layer level of uh, knowledge of what's going on at certain key intersections. So it's possible that this could really happen. Certainly Google has trucks and cars out there recording street view images, so they could put an antenna on top of there and, and, and collaborate. Uh, the privacy technique of a pseudo ID basically makes sure that the real identity is never broadcast. Uh, the pseudo ID changes every five minutes uh, so you have a car that has a certain identity, five minutes later has a new identity and five minutes later has a new identity. A certificate authority gives all these identifiers to one car. Well to all the cars but it would give a whole series of, of identifiers to a single car. In many of the models uh, they use a thing called group leader or a group signature concept. The vehicles travel in groups and what this does is it creates a, a mixed zone to ensure untrackability. Basically if, if a cars all travel in kind of a pack then as they change their uh, pseudo IDs together then um, they will have some level of, uh, of untrackability. They'll have an K anonymity. The problem is that the, all the traffic gets relayed through the group leader. The group leader himself does not have privacy, so that's an issue. The way Parrots works is we use the group model, and when a when a car, let's say you've got car VI, and you've got car VJ, and they travel within range of each other, car VI, uh, VI will say, "Hey, will you parrot me?" 
and VJ will say, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll parrot you. And then when, when VJ, uh, so VI is communicating its signature and, and VJ is com communicating its signature. When VJ shifts to the new to a new group, and there's a new group leader, then VI continues to communicate with its signature, VJ continues to co uh, communicate with its signature, but, but it also communicates with VI's signature. So now we got VI communicating out of this group leader and VI communicating out of this group leader through VJ. Parrots defeats this uh, collaborative attack because the, the, the collaborator can't tell which which group is the right group. They don't know which location it, it is. So they can't uh, cross-track, uh, cross-verify where the where the signature is because basically VI is coming through both both of these uh, directions. E even if the LBS knows the locations that are being asked for, it can't go to the antennas to verify because it's going to still have the same problem. Problem with the parrots model is you need separate sets of pseudo IDs for safety applications. Um, you might need to construct messages. You might need to send many messages uh, to the to the parroter. So yeah, so the parrot so that so it has some you know differences. If it was the same message, that the LBS might be able to see that it was fake. Uh, this is the most important one. Location cannot be part of the signed request. There's another issue which is conditionality. It makes it more complicated to uh, achieve conditional privacy. Uh, so that's an issue. Now let's talk to the to the meat of the question here, the simulation piece. I wrote a program that simulates this parrot's model. The mobility model is this. There's a 3,000 by 3,000 grid, roads every 100 meters. All the vehicles are on the roads. There's no driveways, there's no back alleys or anything and the vehicle communication range is 300 meters. So each vehicle's communication range would be roughly this big within a square this big. Cars travel about 30 meters per second. So they, you know, over the course of a uh, one of these simulation runs, it might go halfway across this grid. The privacy metrics that are collected as the simulation goes through its uh, its iterations are the anonymity set size, which is basically just the number of cars in the group uh, of any given vehicle. It c computes the entropy of the anonymity set size using this equation, which we'll go through the math in another video. And it calculates the tracking probability. In other words, the probability that the set size is 1, that it's a lone ranger out there. The code can be viewed on my website, but this is a quick look at it here. Basically, you have um, a, the number of time slices, the number of vehicles, what percentage of the cars are parrot, are asking to be parroted, what percentage of the cars are, are willing to parrot other cars, and then the seed number for random number generation. And what happens is basically they stay on this grid. Uh, the, the, this is maybe too complicated to explain in a video, but basic idea. Go to the website. It's, the co the code's pretty commented. You can even run it. Just download Python and run the thing. See how it works. Simulation output. Basically, if um, if there's no parroting at all, if you have zero parroting, then you get a anonymity set size of about 1.3 if you have 100 cars over this grid. That's not really very good, but it's, you know, better than nothing. Uh, here you're getting closer to 2. This is 400 divided by 200 would be 2, so you're getting more without, with this is without any parroting. But what's cool to see is if you have 100% of the cars asking to be parroted and willing to parrot, you're almost doubling this in anonymity set sizes with parroting. This is the graphed output. This is the the AS line is the line that if you if, if, of anonymity set size if you have no parroting at all, and these other lines are the incremental amount, the amount of additional parroting. So you really would add them to this AS line. So you're getting up into much higher numbers. 
problems with the simulation, all the cars are on the road instead of parking lots and driveways. Um, the mobility models definitely needs to be modified because the cars tend to go like in, in, in grid, you know, zigzags, which isn't really realistic. Most cars go in long straight lines. Their paths are not zigzaggy. Um, and when the cars reach the edge of the grid, they turn around and go back into the grid. Uh, they really should be, you know, dropped off the grid and then come back in as a new, with a clean slate. Uh, there's a lot of ways to improve the um, mobility model. Also, in, in the in the model I have, they're all the cars are uniformly distributed. Uh, when in reality, they'd probably be concentrated at stoplights and so forth, or main main roads. So it's not really a very accurate simulation, but it's it's a first step. So anyway, I hope you've seen a little bit about the uh, you feel comfortable with with the par the Vonet privacy concept, the Parrot's model, and the simulation that I'm using. Um, look look for future videos to explain more about how this uh, this works. Thanks.